Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship with Grace Presbyterian Church. We're delighted that you have chosen to worship the Lord with us today, both online and in person. You have uh, cards in your bulletin to let us know who you are, any updated information, ways that you would like to help, or ways that you need help. So please feel free to check those boxes and contact us. If you're visiting with us, we offer you a special welcome Hope you will make yourself known to us so that we can welcome you properly and include you in, um, in this church family. It's a wonderful family to which to belong. We are in the middle of stewardship season now. We will make our pledges for the 2022 year on November 7th. And um, on the back of your bulletin, you'll see um, some information about stewardship here at Grace and the website to which you can go to record your story or to read other stories about how uh, our story and Grace's story has intersected in wonderful ways. We will be in the sanctuary next Sunday morning. Yes. It is nothing short of miraculous that we will be, so uh, we will not have pews, but I have personally tested the chairs, and they are very comfortable, right, Chris? You, you got to sit in one, too, so, so the chairs are incredibly comfortable, so come, and, um, and all the lighting might not be installed by then, so just imagine that I look great and have a gorgeous tan. All right, even if you can't see me, you, you know in your mind that that is true. All right, um, also starting next week and continuing on the 7th, our quilters will have their um, biannual quilt auction and sale. And so please come take a look at the beautiful quilts and other things that they make. I, I already have my sights on some of their uh, things that they've made because of what I have heard. So please uh, come support our quilt ministry on those days. Also, on November 7th, we're receiving new members. If you have not joined and you would like to join, a session will greet you after, the, um, after either worship service. We have several people joining after the 1105 service. So if, if you would like to join, just let me know. Also, on that day, we are having our All Saints Luncheon. If you are particularly missing someone that you love, and want to celebrate them, talk about them, receive some comfort and love from your fellow believers, just sign up on the website for that lunch, and it'll be a great time together. You're also invited to bring something that reminds you of that person to share. So, so join us for that if you can. Um, Lynn McCoy is here to tell you a little bit about what the Associate Pastor Nominating Committee is up to. So come on, Lynn. Good morning. I am obviously Lynn McCoy. I am one of the, your co-chairs for the APNC, Associate Pastor Nominating Committee is that acronym. And um, if you happen to be in worship today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name the um, members. Nathan Dahlberg, Brian Hayworth, Susan Hopper, Viola Lee, Dave Long, and my other co-chair is John Mosier. So if any of you happen to be here, stand up and let everybody see you. I think everybody is absent from this service. Okay. <laughs> Moving on, we have met for the first time. We make the second time today. We are in the process of working on the MIF, Mission Information uh, Form, Member Info Information Form, and that will be um, put together using our church mission statement. So anyway, we're just we're in the early early stages. Obviously, we're told that it will probably take about a year. And someone from the committee will be um, getting with you periodically to let you know what's going on. Please don't ask us questions because we won't be able to tell you. <laughs> but we love you anyway. And it's a joy, it's a joy to be doing this mission for all of, all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Um, appreciate all the work of the APNC. It's, it's hard work and it's good work. So thank you uh, for leading us there. Um, today's sermon, if, if you've seen the front of the bulletin, John Moody gave me this complaint form. I love it. <laughs> um, 
Today's sermon is about complaining, and we do it so easily, and it feels right and good when we're doing it, but actually, it's a huge problem in the church in the United States. We gather together this morning to do exactly the opposite. We gather to worship God and to tell God how much we love him and to praise God's holy name. So stand with me right now as we do just that. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, worship your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass And whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, oh my soul His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, you're rich, you're rich in love and you're slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is kind. reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. strength is failing. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, oh Lord, I worship your holy name.
to God, whose goodness shines on me, and to the Son, whose grace has pardoned me, and to the Spirit, whose love has set me free, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. call you are my morning song though darkness fills the night it cannot hide the light who shall i fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can say, you will deliver me, yours is a victory, whom shall I fear, whom shall I fear, I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Nothing formed against me can stand. You hold the whole world in I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. To 
seated. Let us pray. O Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive the truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture reading is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, and we're going to read from verse 14 to 15. Do all things without complaining and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. We pick up the story today in uh, Numbers chapter 14. Listen again for God speaking to you. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become booty. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the Israelites. And Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, John, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the Israelites, The land that we went through as spies is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are no more than bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But the whole congregation threatened to stone them. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I've done among them? I will strike them with a pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a, great, a nation greater and mightier than they. But Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear of it. For in your might you brought up this people from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands over them, and you go in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill this people all at one time, then the nations who have heard about you will say, it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land he swore to give them that he has slaughtered them in the wilderness. And now, therefore, let the power of the Lord be great in the way that you promised when you spoke, saying, the Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Forgive the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have pardoned this people from Egypt even until now. Then the Lord said, I do forgive just as you have asked. Nevertheless, as I live, as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, None of the people who have seen my glory and the signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have tested me these ten times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their ancestors. None of those who despised me shall see it. 
This is the word of the Lord. Jim Simbala, the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn, New York, was welcoming new members after a worship service when he said something he had not planned on saying to them. He said, prompted by the Holy Spirit, he believes, and now I charge you as members of this church that if you ever hear another member speak an unkind word of criticism, complaint, or slander against anyone, myself, an usher, a choir member, or anyone else, that you stop them in mid-sentence. And you say, excuse me, who hurt you? Who ignored you? Who slighted you? Was it Pastor Simbala? Let's go to his office right now so that he can apologize to you, and then we'll pray together so that God can restore peace to this body. But we won't let you talk critically about people who aren't here to defend themselves. I'm serious about this, he writes. And to this day, every time we receive new members, I say much the same thing. That's because I know what most easily destroys churches. It's not government oppression or lack of funds. It's gossip, slander, and complaining that grieves the Holy Spirit. Yes, today's sermon is about complaining. And just to be clear, I'm not complaining about complaining. (laughs) I'm a strong J. According to Myers-Briggs, a judger, that means I quickly decide what I like and don't like. I see flaws easily. On top of that, I'm a perfectionist, so I notice when something is not right. And I'm predisposed, if you will, to complaint and criticism. The one good thing about my personality is that I am normally harder on myself than anyone else. But I do have a right to my opinion don't I? Complaints can change situations for the better, can't they? I feel better when I have a chance to express my disapproval. Yes? We find the Hebrews in Numbers 14 ready to enter the promised land after a year of camping around Mount Sinai. Spies have just returned from the land and reported that it's flowing with milk and honey and unusually large fruit. But the spies also reported that the people who live there were huge and that their cities are fortified. Caleb and Joshua, two of the 12 spies, were optimistic and testified that God could give them this land. But the other 10 were pessimistic and said, we cannot go up against these people. This is where we pick up our story for today. When the people heard the report of the ten, they complained. It would have been better to stay in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here to die? Let's get rid of Moses and Aaron. They even came close to stoning Joshua and Caleb. Yes, they have good reason to complain. First of all, there's nothing but manna to eat. Manna hot cakes, manna burgers, barbecue manna, filet of manna, banana bread. They're tired of it. There's nothing to do with all these kids and animals and all this stuff. The sand is hot. The scenery never changes. And now we've got to fight giants to enter the promised land? No, thank you. But really? They want to go back to Egypt to slavery and infanticide? To false gods who care nothing about them? To be in second class instead of having a land of their own? It may have been real fear that made them say they want to go back. Fear of a hard fight or fear of the unknown. It may have been apathy and laziness that made them want to return to Egypt. I get it. They're tired. 
Complaining is contagious, right? One person starts and it spreads. And it may have been that they just caught it because they weren't wearing a mask. Whatever the reason, at this moment, complaining about their current situation feels good and justified. You know, complaining has much more power than we give it credit. Complaining can do amazing things. First of all, complaining blinds us to the blessings and power of God. The Hebrew people had been freed by God from harsh slavery. They miraculously avoided the plagues God sent upon Egypt. They passed through the Red Sea on dry land. They witnessed the destruction of the Egyptian army behind them. God led them with a cloud by day and fire by night. God provided food in the wilderness, manna and quail for people to eat and water for them to drink. Had they forgotten all that God had done in the past, all the miracles they witnessed with their own eyes. Complaining blinded them to what they already had and who went with them. Church members in the United States seem to be blinded to how blessed we are to be able to worship in freedom. In 51 countries in our world, this gathering is illegal. How blessed we are to worship in a sanctuary We're never going to take that for granted again, are we? (laughs) To have witnessed the love and power of God, to have Christian friends who help and support us. Instead, we complain about everything, big or small. We complain about things like paint color, carpet color, doing repairs, not doing repairs, not being asked to help, being asked to help. The church changing too much. The church changing too little. The sanctuary's too cold. The sanctuary's too hot. Not having enough. Buying too much. Worship being too long. Too traditional. Too contemporary. And I've had that said about the same service. (laughs) And the list goes on and on. And this blinds us to the amazing things that God is doing in us and through us. Complaining also hurts our witness as Christians. Paul wrote the Philippian church telling them to do everything without complaining or arguing so that they could become blameless and pure, shining like stars in the world. And you know the opposite is true. If we complain and grumble, we won't shine like stars. We'll keep the world away. Who wants to join an organization that's unhappy and disgruntled? Not me. Our complaining betrays the fact that we have been given so much love, so much grace, so much mercy from God. Complaining is a poor witness to the Lord. God is so upset at the complaining of the Hebrews that he tells Moses he's just going to wipe them out and start again with him. But Moses makes a good point back to God. He says, look how bad this will look for you. Other nations will hear about it and they'll talk about that you weren't able to bring them into the promised land. In other words, Moses argues that it's a bad witness for God. And God hears him and responds favorably and relents from destroying them. The world is watching the people of God. God's reputation can suffer because of what we do. Complaining destroys our ability to testify to the goodness of the Lord. And finally, complaining us causes us to miss the good things God has planned for us in the future. God is so disappointed by the complaining of his people that he causes them to wander in the desert for 40 more years. So that everyone who complained on at least 10 different occasions will die. They miss the promised land. And they also miss all the blessings of God that were to come on the way and with it. If they had just been thankful and obedient. 
Complaining not only causes us to miss things externally, but it keeps us from becoming who God intends us to be internally. If we complain about every inconvenience, every issue that does not go our way, we never learn from the hard times or grow from our testing. But if we can keep ourselves from complaining, we know our future is bright because our future is with God. No eye has seen nor ear heard nor heart even conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Paul tells the Corinthians, complaining will miss it. Emily Pearl Kingsley shared this essay when she found out that her new baby had Down syndrome. When you're going to have a baby, she writes, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and you make your wonderful plans to see the Colosseum, Michelangelo's David, the gondolas in Venice. You learn some handy phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. And after months of anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane lands. The stewardess comes in and says, welcome to Holland. Holland? What do you mean Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy all my life. I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed in Holland and there you must stay. The important thing is is, is that they haven't taken you to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place. It's just a different place. So you must go out and buy new guidebooks and learn a whole new language. And you will meet a whole new group of people that you never would have met. It's slower paced than Italy, less flashy than Italy. But after you've been there for a little while, you take your breath and you realize that Holland has windmills. And Holland has tulips. Holland even has Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy, and they're all bragging about what a wonderful time they had there. And for the rest of your life, you will say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. That's what I had planned. And the pain of that will never go away because the loss of a dream is a significant loss. But if you spend your life complaining that you never got to Italy, you will never be free to enjoy the very special, very wonderful things about Holland. Everyone has disappointments and heartbreaks. Everyone experiences inconveniences and unpleasant events, sometimes two or even three at one time. Complaining seems to be the thing to do in those times. There's always something to complain about, especially in the church. We're not perfect, and we never will be. But as we have seen, complaining blinds us to the blessings and power of God, makes us a very poor witness to the world, and blocks us from our future. Is complaining worth that? My answer is no, it is not. And with all the strength I can muster, I vow not to complain. You're all witnesses. I will remember the goodness and power of the Lord and thank the Lord for everything. And oh, my friends, if our church can learn to do this, we will shine like stars in the heavens. And in the end, we'll find ourselves in the promised land. Amen?
Friends, every time Jesus took bread into his hands, it was not enough. It was not enough to feed 5,000 people. It was not enough on the night before he died to prolong his life, but he did not complain. He gave thanks. He gave thanks for what was not enough, and it became more than enough for them and for us. Jesus invites all of us to join him at this table of thanksgiving. Let us pray. Holy, magnificent God, we give you thanks and praise for you made us and loved us even when we turned from you. You sent Jesus to teach us, to guide us back to your ways, to heal us and love us, and we killed him. But with great love and power, he rose from the dead and the church was born. The imperfect but perfectly loved church was born. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O God, and upon this bread and wine that it may be for us, the body and blood of Christ. Enough to satisfy our deepest need. Enough to convince us to love as you have loved us. All glory and honor belong to you, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. On the night before he died, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this is the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of your sins and mine. And now every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's saving death until he comes again, and he is coming again. Servers, please come forward. Give us one second for a COVID precaution. <laughs> I'm so thankful for people that will jump in and help. Hold on one second, Bill. We're, we're waiting on gloves. That's the, on gloves. Yes. Yeah. All right. I like that enthusiasm. I like that enthusiasm. <laughs> All right, Mike, come on this side. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come now and be filled.
let us pray. Lord, we are mindful today of all those with a better reason to complain. Those without enough food or clean water or a safe place to dwell. Those who long for freedom and peace. Send us away from this table to bring blessing and healing in your name, Lord. Send us away from this table so that with our joy and praise, we shine like stars in this weary world. Amen. Our story from the seats today is my longtime friend and someone I admire greatly, Brian Flanagan. Come on up. I'll let you fix the mic like you need it. So if you don't like this morning when I'm talking about complain to John, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bring it up with John Priest. I'm a Christian because of grace. I'd like to take you on that journey if you would. When Cindy and I were finishing school, she was in her senior year, as one of my second senior year. And about that time, we met a young man named Randy Gurry. Randy was a couple years older than us, been on staff at LSU for a while. Randy was a, a very strong, very devoted Christian, very bold in his testimony. And when we met Randy, he would ask, Brian, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I didn't. He knew that. Cindy, when I, when I met Cindy at, at 16, she had a personal relationship with Christ. There was always something missing. I knew that, and I was very uncomfortable. So finally, I, it dawned on me how to answer the question. So when I was selling my products at IBM at the time, now, for you young people before keyboarding, there was something called typing. <laughs> and I sold typewriters and copiers with IBM. And I was selling to LSU, and Randy was on staff, so we would meet at the student union. We would meet at his office, and he would ask me, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And so finally I said, yes, I do. He said, good, would you mind sharing it with me? No. <laughs> no, then it wouldn't be personal. <laughs> so fast forward, 1978, we get to Dallas and to Plano, and we join West Plano Presbyterian Church. We go to California outside of San Francisco, and we in Danville, California, we joined Community Presbyterian Church, which just happened to be the same church that Paula and Jack Wilder were in. But we didn't know them because they sat close to the front of the sanctuary where the tither sat. And we were, in the, we were in the back, way back. So we come back and join Grace in January 1983. So I've been searching for this thing called Grace. I've been searching for this thing called Christ. In a 1987-88 time frame, I was going through one of my many male midlife crises, and I was so depressed that Cindy one day said, Brian, you look like the picture on your driver's license. <laughs> you, you, you need to go see somebody. So she sent me to this guy, and he happened to be a Christian counselor. At the end of the second or third session, we get to the door. Now, this is after a 50-minute. I'm pouring my heart out. I'm crying. I'm teared up. And we go to the, this is the end of the session, and he stops at the door and he says, do you know what grace is? What, what is grace? I said, I have no idea. He said, go find out. So I went to find out. And at the time, I was a PBA, and that doesn't stand for professional bowlers. I was a performance-based acceptance kind of guy. I had to earn my job at IBM. I was a non-scholarship athlete in college. I walked on and had to earn the spot on the basketball team. I had to earn my promotion. I had to earn my sales. In fact, if I look back and really pinpoint it, I had to earn my relationship with Cindy because we went out on a blind date on May 7th, 1966. During the night, she regained her sight. And then the... <laughs> Then the next date we had was December 28th, 1960. I had to earn that second date. So I was a performance-based acceptance kind of guy. And what Grace is saying is that all the doing's been done. The battle's been won. All you have to do is accept it. Unmerited favor. An unmerited favor, Jack, was a completely different idea. I didn't know that idea. And so through, I didn't have a Damascus Road experience. I had a process experience. And part of that process, amazing, 
was I, I was at, I was at Indian guys. Now they don't call them Indian guides anymore. They call them Y guides or whatever. But with the YMCA, I was the Indian guides, and I was Gray Eagle because I've been Gray Eagle since my 20s. And I spoke at a, a chapter of the YMCA out in Fort Worth, and a guy came up to me and said, what is, what's, your, what's your address? I'd like to send you something. So on October 3rd, 1988, I get a book in the mail from a guy named Bob Irvin. Never saw him before, never saw him since, but he sent me this book by some guy named Max Lucado. And the book he sent me was, No Wonder They Call Him the Savior. So I want to read some of that, not all of it. I'd like to read some of that because this was, I'm a Christian because of grace. It was like discovering the prize in a box of Cracker Jacks or sport, spotting a little pearl in a box of buttons or stumbling across a $20 bill in a drawer full of envelopes. I read it, but I won't miss it again. It's highlighted in yellow and underlined in red. You may want to do the same thing. Look, Mark chapter 16. Read the, fi the first five verses about the woman's surprise when they found the stone moved to the side. Then feast on that beautiful phrase spoken by the angel. He is not here. He is risen. But don't pause too long. Go a bit further. Get your pencil ready and enjoy this jewel in the seventh verse. Here it comes. The verse reads like this. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Did you see it? Read it again. This time I'll emphasize it. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. Now that is a hidden treasure. If I might paraphrase the words, don't stay here. Go tell the disciples. Pause and then a smile. And especially, especially tell Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. What a line. It's as if all of heaven had watched Peter fall. And it's as all of heaven wanted him to get back up again. Be sure and tell Peter that he's not left out. Tell him that one failure does not a flop make. No wonder they call it the gospel of the second chance. Not many chances in this world. Not many second chances. Jesus had a simple answer. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Then don't live with the dogs. Sure, you can have a second chance. Just ask Peter. It's not every day that you get a second chance. Peter must have known that. The next time he saw Jesus, he got so excited that he barely got his britches on before he jumped into the cold water of the Sea of Galilee. It was also enough, so they say, to cause this backwoods Galilean fisherman to carry the gospel of the second chance all the way to Rome where they crucified him. And if you ever wondered why, what would cause a man to be willing to cru be crucified upside down, maybe now you know. It's not every day that you find someone who will give you a second chance, much less someone who will give you a second chance every day. But with Jesus, Peter got both. At that time in my life, Mickey Mantle was more real to me. Davy Crockett was more real to me. And I was missing salvation by a distance of 12 inches. And that's the distance from my head to my heart. I'd been, Jen Reed doubly had convinced me in this church that I needed to teach high school Sunday school class. And my complaint was, I know nothing. She said, that's the point. You'll learn from them. Tom Brooks, and I think Tom is the only one in the audience that played basketball and, and softball with us back in those days. And, and the, the amazing part of going through Sky Ranch, going through Sunday School, going through Harry Chase's class, now Steve Frazier's Bible Boomers, is that God hides things by putting them near us. And I found Grace right here at 4300 West Park. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? All this searching, and, and I find it here. I find it here in the sanctuary. I find it here in the CE building. I find it in the old cabins that we used to have. I find it with our small group. We have a small group that's been together. Julia, help me out here. 17, 18 years. And I find grace there. I find grace here. If you're looking for grace, you find it here in this sanctuary with this body of people. I I'm honored for that. I'm, I'm blessed for that. I'm saved because of that. And if you, don't, if you haven't found grace, I'll, I'll say this a little bit tongue-in-cheek, embrace grace because it'll help you now and take the heat off of you later. 
I'm a Christian because of grace. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, uh, for telling us part of your story. Friends, we give to God as a sign that we recognize all the blessings God has poured out upon us, and we are so very grateful. You can give today as you leave or always online at gracepc.org. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fear is gone. I'm no longer I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer Rise for the doxology. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now with us every moment. For the times you have borne with us in our complaining, for the ways you have worked around our bad attitudes, we give you thanks, O oh Lord. In great gratitude for all the ways you've blessed us, we give to you, bless and multiply what we give for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. And now unto the God who is able to do beyond what we can ask or even imagine, be all honor and glory and power, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.